Hello, I'm Laura. Welcome to our Lyman Book Club. Hi, I'm Deanne. And I'm Philippe. We are reading The Ringed Castle by Dorothy Dunnett. And today we are going to talk about part one, chapters seven, eight, and nine, which wraps up part one. Mm -hmm. uh, Philippe will lead our discussion before we get into chapter seven. Is there anything overall that you guys want to share about these chapters and part one? I like Philippa. <laughs> that was a neat um, surprise to spend three whole chapters with her. Um, it's kind of cool. Uh, but that being said, I feel like I would have an easier time getting through these chapters and including the stuff we read last week, if I knew more about European history in the era, because I really like this might be stuff that's just known to any school child in England, but I really don't know any of it, unfortunately. So I feel like there was this kind of like I feel like there's kind of a sort of Damocles hanging over this story in terms of like the, you know, Emperor Charles is about to die and Mary doesn't have a kid, but I don't really understand the context of that. And so, so it feels like there's like this ominous thing hanging out there with like the emperor being sick and stuff. And I'm like, but I don't know why that's really bad. So um, I'm tempted, I've been tempted for several weeks just to do sort of a, fly by overview of this part of European history, but I also don't want to spoil things. So I've stayed away from, from learning anything about Ivan the Terrible, except that he's terrible. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so I don't know. I agree, Philippe. I feel like I feel like I would be more nervous about the political machinations that are happening here if I was aware of the doom that mm -hmm. there was potential for so but i think that um like without being too spoilery i think that the doom like these chapters really give us a sense of the doom hanging over mary like mm -hmm. how much rides on her having this child right um and you know we all we know from history and i mean you can tell in the text that she's mm -hmm. not really pregnant and um, you know, she wants this so, so badly. And it's like, not only does her, you know, lineage depend on it, her power depends on it. Mm -hmm. Her religion, the continuation of her religion in England depends on it. Mm -hmm. Her marriage depends on it. Like everything depends on this baby. And she wants it so badly. She's convinced herself that she's pregnant and she's going to have a baby. And like, you know, she's wrong. Yeah. Um, and I think Dunnett is focusing on that because um, she's gonna, she, she tends to take themes from the history era that she's writing about and like incorporate those themes into the story through her characters. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't wanna say anything too spoilery about that, but I think that's why she's spending so much time mm -hmm. on it. Yeah, I mean, this definitely, this deep longing for a child came through these chapters you know and just Mary's desperation and and even what little I know of European history I know that Mary's gonna die in a couple of years like like two or three like maybe like maybe that soon she's gonna die so it's there was this sense of hopelessness I think with her situation and it was also sort of interesting I felt um that she was done it sort of casts her in kind of this pathetic light like you feel sorry for her and there's this um uh sympathy that kind of i felt for her and previous to reading these chapters my only like real thought about mary is that she was a horrible person because all these people got burned to death in england and like you know she was such a tormentor of protestants and yet reading these chapters, it sort of seems like, like maybe that wasn't really her. It was like these other guys, I forget the names, but it mentions a couple of people who are like, nope, they didn't stop it. They kept going. Mm. Well, and there's a line about how this is how she's like trying to buy the baby from God kind of. Yeah, like, like, yeah that's how one does, does those kinds of things, you know? 
sure. Like God's like a vending machine that you can put in burned at the stake people and get out healthy baby. But like the way that, that, um, I think the way that Janet paints her as she's kind to children and, and she's like, she's not that smart, but she works so hard. Um, and, and like all these ways that you just feel her like pushing herself to her limits because she's in this impossible situation. And like, yeah, it's actually really sad. Like, obviously she's doing horrible things, but she's, as with the baby, she's like deluded herself into thinking that it's necessary. So it's like, you know, if she wasn't in this position, maybe she'd be this lovely, nice person, but because of the position she's in, she's, you know, letting these awful things happen yeah. and doing awful things. There's a line that Philippa says, at some point I underlined it, but it's something about how like she's inadequately prepared for like the worst job in the world or something like that. There's there's some line about it being like the worst office in the world or something and and how she's just not, she's not able to do the job because she wasn't. And also she just wasn't prepared for it as a kid. Like she didn't grow up learning how to do this. And yeah. So I kind of came out of these chapters with sympathy for Mary, which I was not expecting. <laughs> yeah. Um. Mm. Shall we jump into chapter seven? Let's do it. <laughs> right. So uh, we begin the chapter with Philippa at the cane play, which I assume is some sort of amalgamation of a joust and some other sort of athletic prowess competition. I wasn't quite sure. Um, I, I thought it was kind of like the horse thing that yeah. we saw in the last book. Like that's what, that's what I was imagining. Like the thing with the horses going back and forth that was so amazing. And like, that was the good version. And then it got mixed up with jousting and turned into this pathetic, sad thing that everybody was laughing at. I don't know. Yeah, but what we take away from the King play is that it is an absolute disaster and that King Philip is fairly non-athletic and sort of makes a fool of himself. Um, the character of Don Alfonso seems to be very interested in Philippa. Um, and then Philippa enters Queen Mary's service. There's a lot of history about King Henry VIII and his wives and sort of how Mary sort of got to where she is. Philippa ends up talking to Austin Gray and she asks him about Leonard Bailey, who is Lyman's uncle, estranged uncle. Um, and throughout the section, we get a lot of political stuff. Like for instance, the Lennoxes have been whispering in Mary's ear that they want her to execute Elizabeth. Um, at some point, Philippa meets Asham. Is that his name? Is that how you pronounce it? The tutor. Yeah, the tutor. He's one of the two Latin tutors that sort of are fighting with each other, Asham and um, she meets the other one. She's yeah. either John Elder. Somebody. Elder, yes. Elder's the one we don't like, right? He's Henry Darnley's tutor, yeah. So He's such a little brat. <laughs> yes, well, surprise, surprise. Um, so when she's talking to Asham, he asks Philippa if she knows uh, Lichpole. Um, and then Philippa ends up meeting Lichpole and finds out finally that Lyman is in Moscow through Lichpole because Lichpole is sort of uh, a messenger back and forth. Uh, that's sort of how they're communicating, although they're not really communicating because Lyman is not reading any of Philippa's letters or throwing them into the fire before he's finished with them. Um, so, but it's interesting because I think Lyman basically told Lichpole to tell Philippa that that's where he is. So I get the sense that Lyman trusts Philippa with this information. That was my take on it. That may not be what's actually happening. It's just what I wrote in my notes. So I could be wrong. Um, the queen gets sick. So Philippa visits Mary Lennox. Uh, I don't know what that says. Margaret Lennox. Margaret Lennox. Oh, sorry, Margaret Lennox. Yes. Too many M names. Um, Margaret interrogates Philippa about the marriage. Um, there's this really great line that we can talk about more in depth, but I think Philippa is on to Margaret because one of the things she describes her as is having smiling, violent eyes, which is just so descriptive and perfect for her. Um, so then Philippa writes a letter to Kate. And that's basically all I have written for now. Um, but I have some other things that I'll bring up as we 
delve further into this chapter. Well, I guess just going in order, um, we, we talked already about Mary, but I did just want to point out like some of the ways that Dunnett paints her as sympathetic is um, she's talking about her obsessive hard work in a woman who was only moderately clever in one of the hardest offices yeah, that's in the, the world. Way. Yeah, and then also her enjoyment in children, um, in the care she took with the common people on her travels, stopping to speak with them and anonymously to care for their troubles. The idea that she's not just doing it for like politics, but she's she genuinely is trying yeah. to help people. I mean, maybe she's doing it for her religion, but she seems, and not get credit yeah. for it. Like she's not asking for public credit for what she's doing, which is admirable. So. And then you also get the sense of just like kind of the twisted childhood that she had, how she was, you know, as, as a child, she had seen herself as an empress and as a grown woman had known herself to be no more than an aging, emotional spinster, the bride of God. So Henry, you know, jerking around everybody, jerking around his own children. Which of um, the wives was Mary's mother? The first one. First one. Erica, is that right? Yeah, Catherine of Erica. And she yeah. died, right? I forget the order. Is it died, beheaded? Forced her. Divorce. And okay. She divide. She died many, many, many years later. Okay. So divorce, beheaded, death. Divorce, beheaded, death. I think is the order. No, one of them survived okay. him. The last one survived him. All oh, right. See, I don't know my English history. Divorce, beheaded, died. Divorce, survived. Beheaded, okay. Died. Divorce is first, though, because yeah. he divorced. He divorced Catherine Eric. Well, and that's what started the Church yeah, of England, yeah. right? Yeah. Right. Because exactly, exactly. divorce wasn't a thing that one could do before that. So. Well, you could, but it was super, super, super hard. And yeah. Yeah. He didn't want no pope telling him what to do. Well, it, and also Catherine of Aragon wouldn't give him a divorce. Like he could have, he could have gotten an annulment if, if she'd been willing to say like, yeah, we never had sex, but she wasn't willing to say that. So. Right, and again, no, like, why really... would she? That would be really dumb, so, yeah. Uh, Henry. So then we spent some time with Austin Gray, um, and I, I just, I wanted to ask you guys again, now that we're seeing more of Philippa's time with Austin, uh, thoughts on him? I don't know. I mean, he's coming across as, like, fairly benign, kind of, but... And I mean, it's not unreasonable that a young man would be attracted to this woman who is quasi unavailable and mysterious and competent and attractive. And, you know, it was, it's like, sure, like his neighbor shows up and she's changed, you know, like she's transformed into this woman who's you know, married, but maybe not, you know, <laughs> like there's this, I can see why there's this attraction and it makes sense. It's completely logical that he would be attracted to her and like want to spend time with her and all that. But I'm just, uh, the, the Dunnett book reader in me is like, <laughs> what's going on with Austin Cray? <laughs> yeah, so. I don't trust him. Um, yeah. I don't know if he's benign or malignant, but I, I have a feeling that he will be easy, easily manipulated by Margaret Lennox to get information about what's happening, whether he means to purposely give it up or not. So that's a good point. Yeah. Whether, like I said, whether he means it or not, I just don't think that it's a good relationship to, for Philippa to pursue. He's not coming across as like particularly savvy or competent mm -hmm. as a character so so yeah i agree like perhaps it's just that he's someone who's easily manipulated and that's going to be a problem but i do feel like he's going to be a problem in some way like that this is not a character that this is not an archie type character who's just mm -hmm. going to come in and help so. no we spent too much time on him for him to just sort of disappear and have no further plot surrounding him also what do you think about um does it come up in this chapter what do you think about bartholomew lynch pole kind of he's kind of on the edges of all three of these chapters but well here's my question 
as we're reading these three chapters, do we get a sense of how Margaret Lennox knows that Lyman is in Russia? Where does she get that information from? Because we hmm. find out at the end of chapter nine that she knows. So there's not a lot of avenues for her to get that information, right? Unless she's got some random informant in Moscow, which I guess is not out of the question, but is Lynchpole like betraying them? I don't know. It's a possibility. She might also have gotten the news from Dick and Chancellor, although she sort of, I mean, this is getting way ahead of ourselves, but she sort of threatens to kill him if he doesn't come back with Lyman. So I don't know if that's necessarily an avenue, but that may be how she first learned of it. Maybe. But he's so close with Henry Sidney. I don't know. I'm kind of suspicious of Lynchpole a little bit. It's a possibility. I don't think, well, no, he's the one that has the discussion with um, Philippa about if she asks him if anybody has read the letters. So it's possible he is lying. Yeah, he says no. And mm. like, but it, but the only assurance that Philippa has that all this is, is confidential is he just assures her. Mm -hmm. he doesn't have any other, there's no other um, like evidence. So I don't know. Anyway, just a thought to pay attention to um the reason i was talking about austin earlier i was just kind of going chronologically through the chapter is there's a couple interesting notes about him the one i thought most interesting was um how kate and philippa had judged him early on as tender-hearted mm -hmm. um and i think that kind of goes with what you're saying about perhaps he might be easily manipulated um but he also seems kind of like bedazzled by philippa um you know he seemed to regard her power of observation and analysis as something worth celebrating on their own um so he doesn't quite like hold his own with her but he certainly like admires her yeah. um, insights and etc yeah he thinks that she's i think he thinks she's pretty amazing or at least you know like his and you can just see this you know if if we believe this description of him that he's you know tender-hearted and whatever um you can just see this like tender-hearted perhaps slightly naive young man like being bowled over by this woman who has all of this international experience and comes back you know it's it's like it's like that typical rom-com scene you know where like the the nerdy quiet and attractive girl goes away and then she comes back and she's like stunning and, <laughs> and competent and has learned all the all the whatever you know and um you can see why like the neighbor boy would, <laughs> would be enthralled by that so um, we also have him asking her something that kind of becomes a recurring theme in the chapter because um, Margaret Lennox has a similar suspicion. Um, he says, what dreams are in your head, Philippa? Is it dreams which prevent the annulment from taking place? Mm -hmm. So people are starting to get suspicious that there is actually something between her and Lyman and then that's why they haven't gotten their annulment yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I thought, well, we can talk about it when we get there, but I thought Philippa handled that conversation really well with Margaret Lennox. <laughs> Although, I mean, I think Lennox, I think Margaret's still suspicious of her, but she seemed to handle it pretty well. I thought Christian Stewart handled her interactions with Margaret Lennox well, but it still didn't turn out well <laughs> for Christian Stewart. Oh, it doesn't really turn out well for a lot of people, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Margaret. Um, but it is, it is funny how Margaret seems so, you know, polite and gentle, and yet she's like the deadliest person. Mm -hmm. I knew she was going to be back. Yeah. Ugh. Um. So then I, I, there is the bit in here about um, how Margaret Lennox is trying to get the queen to kill her sister Elizabeth. Um, which I guess is pretty obvious sure. why, because if Elizabeth's gone, Margaret Lennox is probably the heir to the, the yeah her there. her claim is way more solid right if if elizabeth isn't around so yep um it just the whole thing this whole situation just made me think about elizabeth at this age and she's you know she's still a teenager and she's grown up in such incredible like chaos and and 
being moved from here to there and like threats of is she going to be killed is she going to be in prison forever you know and just all of this and she's still a girl who's a teenager and apparently super smart and yeah I don't know. She's gonna be married off and sent to some random country far away. Yeah. Never <laughs> some random tiny landlocked country where she can never cause a problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. So what is your take on Philippa's um, supposed insights into Lyman after she finds out he's in Russia, where she thinks he has an opportunity for dominion which he could expect nowhere else? Um, and she thinks, I think later also about how, um, you know, how she operates on this scale of like being able to change the world, basically. Mm -hmm. I mean, she spent enough time in his orbit to sort of see what a brilliant mind he has. And I think she's got really high expectations of his abilities um, just because surely, you know, how she saw him handle all of the situations in the the Seralia, uh, the the palace, and just how you know they escaped together before he sort of fell victim to his withdrawal. Yeah, I think Philippa has a little bit of what everybody has about Lyman, which is kind of this mythologized view of him as you know, because we we've talked multiple times in multiple books about him being like described as a machine or as you know inhuman and I don't mean that Philippa sees him that way but but just that there's this sense that oh he would be attracted by the the ability to control empires you know or that he would be um of course his primary goal is going to be to be in a situation where he can you know even 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 a benevolent perception of him where it's like he, he wants to be in the situation where he can do the most good you know and all that and I think what it leaves out is Lyman the man you know and and the person and I don't think Philippa has a good sense of him as a person yet like I think she see she understands him more as a scholar and because of his library, like she's seen how much he knows. And I think she admires his ability to strategize and, and as a political figure and, and all those things. But um, there's still that, that element of his heart that I don't think she sees yet. I hope she will see at some point. <laughs> I hope somebody sees it. <laughs> um, but yeah. But then we also have this sense where he's kind of, his heart is kind of cold right now in, in Russia. So um, like maybe it's not that inaccurate of a description of Lyman as he is now, so. It's really interesting um, now that you mention it because of sort of this standoffish way that Lyman has been so far in this book that we're spending so much time away from him like the the narrative of the book sort of is echoing how Lyman is living his life at the moment. Mm -hmm. She's keeping everyone at a distance, even the reader. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure we'll get a lot more of him going forward, but up to this point, this book has mostly been Philippa. Yeah. Think also about the title of the book. The Ringed Castle. Uh -huh. So like a castle with defenses, it's defenses up. Exactly, exactly. Even we as the reader haven't been able to really get through it yet. Mm -hmm. um, so then we also have Philippa. Um, she had been much in demand over Christmas. So, you know, it's funny because we're in her point of view and she doesn't think much of it, but we can kind of look at it from outside and be like, she's super popular. All these guys are so into her. Like, yeah. Came back beautiful and refined and smart and fun and yeah, yeah and she's just like whatever yeah she's just, again it's that I just adore her practical like prosaic sense of the world and she's just like meh you know and, and just really thinking about her relationships not in the sense of like 
how popular she is or how um how like what people can do for her or how attractive she is but more more in this the sense of she's a person and she's building relationships and and she's trying to have I think she is trying to be politically aware and savvy um I don't know she's up against Margaret Lennox though which is I mean, for all of Philippa's newfound skills in this area, I'm not sure that she doesn't seem to be winning so far with, with mm -hmm. Margaret Lennox. So. Not yet. This is uh, jumping ahead a bit, because I know this is more towards the last chapter, but I think it's starting already. There's this reticence that Philippa has to go back and spend time with Kate. Like she's almost pushing it off. And I know later it's because she has this information about Lyman's parentage and you know that's why she doesn't sort of want to go north and visit mid culture or her mother but there's I think there's something else going on as well mm -hmm. like I almost wonder if she feels guilty about some way about marrying Lyman and how that may have affected their relationship with each other I thought it was interesting that she says she makes this statement on 109 at the bottom where she's talking about um her relationship with uh where is this this is where um austin is talking to her and like makes this do you really want to divorce him kind of thing and i'll get the annulment and she says um uh nor i imagine do you have any recollection of what lyman is actually like my mother in italics <laughs> my mother can barely put up with him we can't get an annulment because blah 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 and I'm just like, that's not actually true. And she knows it because she knows that her mother and Lyman are friends and she's witnessed their friendship throughout her teenage years. So it's kind of interesting that she's saying like, my mom can't stand him when she knows that's not true. So yeah, maybe. I mean, it definitely, you know, politically benefits her to make a, make it very clear that she's not into him. So, right. sure, I'm exaggerating for that reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what's your take on her meeting with young Darnley? Ugh, what a little prat. He's a Ugh. little, yeah, pill. Ugh. What page is what page is that on? 116, um, where she greets him in Latin and he replies in English, I am afraid, madam, your Latin is not of the same order as mine. And she just says, I should have thought. <laughs> yeah. I love that it says, taking her time, Philippa measured him from head to foot with her eye. And you can just see like him probably getting a little pissed off because like, <laughs> yeah, I loved it. Um, um, yeah. Okay. Anyway, this is that scene with uh, Flippa and, and Margaret about Lyman. And um, it was interesting to read. I liked the, I love the way Dunnett did this scene where, where we actually see Flippa kind of figure things out as the scene progresses. And so like, there's the moment where um, Margaret says, you know, did you not find him pleasing? There was something between them Kate had said and looking at those smiling, smiling violet eyes, Philippa suddenly knew her, what it was. She said, levelly, I admire. And so then she just goes into like, no, I'm not interested. <laughs> you know, she, she talks about how like, there's never anything between us, da, da. but it was neat to see her be like, oh, and then <laughs> continue. It is funny how done it almost never spells out what it was between them, but like she sets it up so you can read between the lines about, you know, Margaret's abusive, sadistic obsession, mm -hmm. sexual hatred like thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's completely obsessed with Lyman. It's and jealous and possessive and hates him. Yeah. And she's possessive. Dead. No one else can have him. I'm yeah. jealous of every woman that he comes near and I want him dead. Yeah, it's like it's like he's a toy and she wants to break it before anybody else plays with it, yeah. you know? That, if I can't have him, no one can. Right, right. Mm -hmm. um, I love how quickly Philippa catches on. Um, yeah. 
I also like the I like the um, characterization of Darnley because I think you know Dennett being Scottish is writing for a Scottish audience, so they're gonna know that he will marry Mary Queen of Scots and then you know get her secretary murdered and then get murdered probably by a conspiracy that involves her um, and definitely sets it up in a way sympathetic to Mary, where even if she was guilty of getting him killed, he clearly you she's know, a terrible just, person and probably treated her terribly and. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, we don't we don't like him. <laughs> so. I definitely like he's his mother and his father's son. Um, and there's a super creepy moment where she um lifts Philippa's face as she might lift a doll's by the chin. Mm. Oh, it's so creepy. Yeah. Yeah, and that like we must find a husband worthy of you from among all those eager escorts at court. And you just get another sense of like her jealousy that this girl has come in. Like it's even more than just Lyman. It's like this girl has come into court and these men are sort of flocking around her and Margaret Lennox does not like it. Yeah. That, that could be a possible way that she ends up manipulating um, Austin Gray by saying like, look, as soon as we get rid yeah. of Lyman in her marriage, like she's open for you. Like we'll set up a marriage with you. Oh yeah, that would not surprise me at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that she just, she uses his attraction for Flippa for some nefarious purpose that, <sighs> terrible um. woman. Um, yeah. Also, I thought it was interesting after this interview with Margaret, Philippa has this wave of homesickness and gets exhausted. And it says, um, she realized for the first time how tired she was. Nursed by the staff of Sir Henry, she slept for the better part of 24 hours, then resumed her usual acute interest in her fellow human beings and her half begun note to her mother. And so it's like after this, interview with Margaret she just collapses and you get this or I got the sense that she's just been mentally and emotionally like so focused on not making mistakes and like functioning in this court and staying <laughs> staying appropriate and like doing the appropriate thing and 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 has just had this mental focus so hard and then she goes through this interview with Margaret Lennox where she just has to be, she can't make any mistakes with her. And then it finishes and she just collapses. And once she gets to a safe place, she just can't go any further. And Yeah, I think in addition to the, everything you said, there's also just the physical exhaustion of keeping the same schedule as Mary, which is oh, yeah. super, like you're working yourself sick. Right, basically. right. But yeah, not surprising that Margaret Lennox would be the one to push her over the edge. Yeah, oh, Margaret. Oh. So there's a bunch of names that come up a few times in here that are kind of worth remembering. Um, one of them is Edward Courtenay, who we keep hearing about. Um, I just zone out, but. Um, and then we also start hearing about John B. Um, mm -hmm. John B. Mm -hmm. The astrologer. Yes, and we hear more about him later. And the inventor of mechanical animals. Like automatons? Yeah. Yeah. I've always paid slight attention to him just because we have the same name. <laughs> is he the philosopher as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he invented Enochian, which is what the angels speak in Supernatural. The language of the <laughs> 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 uh. Oh, John D. So he said, I always saw John D. like probably a bad analogy, but I always saw him as kind of like a Rasputin kind of character. Like he's sort of seen as like magical, but not magical, like kind of sciencey, kind of magical, and people don't really know. And there's all these stories about him. Of course, Rasputin has all these terrible stories too that John D. doesn't have. But um, he just always struck me as that kind of figure when you read about him that people are like, he was kind of magic and he was kind of sciencey and 
you know, all that. So I mean, like science and magic weren't that far apart at this era, yeah. you know, alchemy led to chemistry and also led all into craziness. Yeah. <laughs> Astrology and astronomy and mm. you know, hand in hand. Yeah. Um, I wanted to bring up that uh, in Kate's letter, the letter to Kate, the way that it ends specifically, where um, the last line is, oh, Kate, your only error in life was to make me a girl instead of a man, dot, dot, dot. How was Kazoom? Totally brought me back to the Kazoom like the boat moment in the last book, where it's like this complete sort of change of pace and it's about Kazoom again, so. Yeah, but it's kind of not. It's almost like it's almost like that question is is just this afterthought stuck at the end of the letter, which I don't know. I'm curious about this because Kate, I mean, Philippa was so focused on this baby in the last book, you know, and it was is so like she was like an arrow just shot towards this kid, and that was her focus was saving him, and then once he's with her mother or once he's, you know, on the boat, I guess. Um, and then with Kate, it's like, he's not part of her focus at all. Like her task has been accomplished and now it's over. And so it doesn't seem that he's part of her thought process at all. Mm -hmm. or, so is she, so my, I guess my question is, is she genuinely not concerned about him because he's with Kate and Kate's a great mom and she'll do, he'll be fine there is she is he she genuinely not concerned about him because he's just not important to her anymore or is she avoiding caring about him because of very you know because she's suspicious that he's Gabriel's kid or because you know like is there something else that's causing her to not engage with him I think there's also just very different social norms at the time around mm -hmm. how one would go about raising a child. Like you wouldn't be raising them yourself. Like the re like you have servants that do all that that's stuff. Right. Oh, I forgot. That's true. That's true. You don't really, your kids don't really come into your life until they're like mini adults. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. That's right. I forgot about that. Um, I mean, I definitely also think she cares about him still. Um, but it is interesting that she, yeah, she's really stepping away. And I feel like it kind of goes back to the way she's admiring Lyman does this man of the world who can change the destiny of nations. Like she's interested in making a difference on that scale. Yeah. yeah. I think he's still important to her though. I, I think it's more of the first where she's not as worried because he's with Kate. She just doesn't need to be worried about him anymore. Yeah. Yeah, it's not like, you know, when she set out on this journey, he had nobody. Now he's got a bunch of people. Right, 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 right. He doesn't need, she doesn't need to be there for him because he has support. And, yeah. Well, and as we see, it's increasingly more and more difficult for her to get away from the court. So she literally can't be there at the moment. So. Yeah. I am curious about what's going on. <laughs> like, how's the kid doing? I'm curious about him but I also I was a little bit sad that we didn't see Lyman in these chapters like I miss him you know I, I miss <laughs> Lyman. I want to know how he's doing and, and I'll be back I know any other thoughts on chapter seven no not really so chapter eight um so Philippa heads back to court from, she was at um, the Lennox's, I think, at the end of the chapter, right? I don't know. My note says she heads back to court. She was so. at Sydney's. Oh, she was at the Sydney. She took like a week break from, from her exhaustion. Um, she produced, she helped produce a Turkish mask for the palace. Um, and then uh, the whole entourage moves to Hampton Court Palace for the birth. Um, they do this really interesting thing where since the, queen is going to be sort of at risk of dying during childbirth, they either send her political enemies as far away as possible or as close as possible and keep them under lock and key so that if anything were to happen with the queen, um, those people won't sort of 
be an issue, I think is what that is. Anyway, that's why Elizabeth ends up being sort of locked in the same palace as well, um, or maybe not the same palace, but close by. So Philippa writes to Lyman. She actually tells him in this letter that Sibylla is not his mother. The information that she got from Sibylla's sister, um, she sends that letter off. Um, there's a rumor that gets spread that the queen has given birth early, which, oops, how are they going to explain that one? Not true. <laughs> Not true at all. Uh, Philippa actually ends up visiting Elizabeth because she's taking something to her. I can't read my notes. I'm sorry. I have terrible handwriting. Well, but she, she's taking her books. Books. Yes, that is what that letter, that, that says books, although it's really badly. Um, so the Lennoxes are plotting to take Scotland. And that's sort of what Elizabeth tells her during their talk is the gist of it. And then Elizabeth says she warns her not to come visit her again because it could be dangerous for Philippa. Um, this is when Philippa decides, of course, that she's going to go to Russia, leave the court behind. She's going to go and find Lyman and convince him to come back for Sibylla's sake. Mm -hmm. Um, but before she does any of that, she goes to visit Leonard Bailey, the estranged uncle. Sort of ends up just forcing her way into the house. She's written him a letter saying she's coming, but he doesn't want anything to do with her. So she finds her own way in um, and eventually learns from Leonard Bailey, who ended up taking care of Gavin, that... Oh, so what happened was Gavin's father returned and kicked Leonard Bailey out of mid culture. And he says he has proof that Sibylla is actually Lyman and Eloise's mother, which goes directly against what Sibylla's sister said. So Sibylla's sister says that Gavin is the father of both and not. Sibylla has nothing to do with it. And now Leonard Bailey's saying that Sibylla is the mother of both, but Gavin has nothing to do with it. So we've got two different stories here. I believe but Bailey. I believe Bailey, yes. But I, I think so. the truth probably lies somewhere in the middle. But I, I yes. tend to believe Bailey more. The only yes. thing that both stories have in common is that the children were both born in France. So right. something happened with Sibylla in France yeah. And we just don't know what it is yet. But geez, I really want to find out. I have a suspicion that is not a fully formed suspicion, but we can talk about it when we get there. Um, so. George Bailey does say that he has proof and that he can prove it, but the only way he'll give that proof is if Lyman himself comes to claim it. And that is what I have for chapter eight. I feel like Lyman's going to show up at his house and he's going to be dead or something. <laughs> I think there's going to be like some like last... Um like failure to give the evidence and we're never gonna know what it is or like margaret's gonna find out and burn the house down yes. or something. Right. Like, how margaret dare lyman know his parentage kills him and burns the house down. <laughs> yeah something like that uh we're never gonna know what this is a lot of this chapter was just waiting for the queen to give birth to her imaginary baby and of course it doesn't yeah. happen and just that bit about like burning of the heretics is, mm -hmm. is is happening more and more. And there's that bit that you brought up earlier, Philippe, about how the burnings are her bargain with God. The recanted souls will save her child in her marriage. Well, that was Laura that brought that up, but oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And that, and then, uh, yeah, it's sad and super not theologically <laughs> sound <laughs> like yeah um and then i wrote on 126 she's got this whole bit where she's writing um is this a letter that she was writing to lyman yeah yeah and it's just full of assumptions so like she writes, after the birth of Richard, Sibylla had no more children. You and your sister were born to your father in France of mother or mother's unknown, et cetera. And it's just, she's, she's writing these assumptions as 
fact to Lyman. And I'm so curious how this letter is going to land. Like if he's, because he hasn't received this letter as far as we know. Like we haven't, we've only seen him receive the first one, which he threw in the fire, but maybe he will finish reading it. Yeah. So he's either not going to get this information at all, or he won't believe it, or I don't know. We'll, we'll see. I I hopefully mean, we do get to see his reaction to this letter at some point. I'm not, I'm not sure that telling him that his mother is not actually his mother is going to be welcome news. <laughs> like he's deeply enmeshed with his mother and like their relationship is incredibly important to him. So I'm not sure the news of like, hey, Sabella's not really your mother, someone else is. I'm not sure that's gonna land very well. <laughs> Well, and she's got this idea of like, oh, he's this man of the world, right. um, and this isn't going to make any difference yeah. to him. And it's like, yeah, oh, like, like oh, no, yeah. <laughs> like, this is this it's, is not. Also, don't tell him in a letter. Like, it's curious to me why she has no problem writing this version of what she thinks happened to him in a letter. But then when she finds out the other version, she's like, do I even tell Lyman? Like, what do I do with this information now that I have it? Here's what I think is going on there. What I think is going on is that she thinks the most important part of this story to Lyman is his mother's honor, that mm. he is an honorable woman. And that if she tells, when she tells Lyman that, hey, you're illegitimate, what she's telling Lyman is that your mother did not have sex outside of marriage. Your mother is an honorable woman. So come home, you know? And if she tells him that she and that he and Eloise are Sibylla's children by another man, then what she's actually telling him is that his mother broke her marriage vows and his mother had an affair and that that news will be devastating to him. And so she just doesn't understand that perhaps the vows of marriage are not as important to Lyman as, I mean, the fact that his mother cheated on Gavin, I can't imagine him being all that upset about it. Like Gavin was horrible to him. And I mean, yes, culturally in that time, like for Sibylla to do that is a huge scandal and would cause lots of problems, but I don't know. I just don't see Lyman rejecting his mother because he's illegitimate. I don't know. It's also interesting that the Sibylla sister version of the story gives us a reason why Marta would exist because, you know, Gavin was off doing things in France or wherever, but there's no version of Marta in George Bailey's version of the truth, so... Yeah, Leonard Bailey. Yeah. yeah. Oh my God. George Bailey. <laughs> well, I said Mary Lennox earlier from Secret Garden, so I'm getting all the literary characters now. <laughs> it's like whenever a bell rings, <laughs> um, <laughs> the bank. Anyway, sorry, I just have Jimmy Stewart in my head. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, the uh, what was I gonna say? Um, Marta. Okay, so if we have. Uh, and I want to think about this more when we get to Bailey's story, but if we have, if we go with Bailey's story, which I am more inclined to believe, Sibylla has had an affair with some random guy that we don't know. And that random guy is Marta's father, not Gavin. So Marta is not related to Sibylla or Gavin, but to person X, who is Lyman and Eloise's father, hmm. right? Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. I would seem to think that because they look so similar that Lyman and Marta have the same set of parents, but I, I don't know. I think it may be like a literary device though that they look so similar. Yeah. Maybe not though. Maybe. I just don't see, maybe, I don't see Sibylla abandoning a kid. I can't either, unless she has a really good reason for it. Unless they told her like the baby died or something. And I don't know. We're going to get that truth eventually. Yeah. I, and I do hope that Marta shows up somewhere in this book. Yeah. Yeah. But um, if not, then she'll definitely be in the last one. Yeah. I mean, do we want to talk about Bailey's story? Is there anything else we want to talk about the queen? 
and the fake. Yeah, yeah, let's slide. just go in order. <laughs> um, well, I was going to say, what is your thoughts on Philippa committing this incredibly sensitive information that could be used by his enemies um, to paper and sending it off in a world full it's of It's not spies. the brightest thing she's done. <laughs> Again, I'm suspicious of what's his name, you know, because <laughs> she gives him this letter and yeah. 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 Um, we also did not comment on the fact that she organizes a, um, a mask, um, Turkish themed, because she is the only person in the English court who's been to Turkey. Um, and she goes to the Revels storehouse in the old Blackfriars Monastery and manages to put the whole thing together for a like very 45 low sum pounds of money. or something, 47 pounds or something. Yeah. Winning praise not for both taste and yeah. economy. I so want this party to have been like just a bonkers bit of Philippa's imagination. <laughs> like I so want her to have just created this nonsensical version of the Turkish court that, that, that the English would be clueless about whether it's true or not. And I just think it would be, I mean, maybe she did a real legitimate reenactment of whatever but I just think it'd be super funny if she's like I'm the only one who knows so we're gonna do all this crazy stuff um it would be fun to be a fly on that yeah. wall if this oh, is yeah. ever a movie yeah. I so want that scene to, like I would love to have a couple of these conversations be moved into that mask party you know like just have her encountering several people that that she encounters in different places in the book but have them all happen at the party so that mm. there could just be this bonkers party um so then skipping ahead 126 there is a line here that i like because it gives an idea of the pressure that that mary's under um and it says they were waiting as the whole world was waiting for the queen of england at last to give birth um and this is referring to various of the the spaniards because like certain political talks and negotiations are, are on hold pending this child because this child will change the whole political landscape of Europe. Um, so like literally all these people, like this whole like chessboard of European politics yeah. is like waiting on this imaginary baby yeah. and just like awful pressure on Mary. I don't know, like you do just feel for her. It's also super interesting to me the way that like done it brings this Euro eurocentric worldview into the story which i think is completely appropriate because this is the way that they thought you know that that the whole world is waiting when in reality the whole world was definitely not waiting like there's there's huge swaths of the world that could have cared less about what was happening with the british monarchy even if you know and a lot of them didn't know about the british monarchy so it's just funny that um like phrases like this are so appropriate to the story because that's the mentality that this group of characters had. But at the same time, it's such a flawed view of the world. Oh, for sure. And I mean, I think we got, we can, we also have even that perspective from within the story. Cause like Ivan doesn't care. Suleiman doesn't care. Like oh. doesn't affect them. they got their own business going on. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, Suleiman could, care less about what's going on with some random English queen's pregnancy. So um, yeah. And the whole thing with the like the celebrations in London because the news went out that she had the baby is just like it's just heartbreaking and it's so awful. Like the way that politics works now where it, it makes her a joke that she didn't have the baby. Um yeah. and she's already under so much pressure. Yeah. Um and then the um the scene right after that where um a crowd arrives with three screaming children successfully born a few days before to a woman of low stature and great age like the queen um and so this idea of philippa wants to send them away because it just rubs it in like someone else had three babies at your age and and like you haven't managed to do it um but J it's jane dormer who brings them in and the queen speaks to them with tears in her eyes and it's like you know this queen isn't like a bitter envious person at all she like is actually very loving um it just like makes it extra sad yeah how old is she right now do we know she's because they keep talking about her as middle-aged 
like that that phrase came up more than once and so she was she was born in wait, I wrote it down in the back of the book so she was born in 1516 so 26 36 46 so she was like in her mid 30s I think mid to late 30s which mid is really like yeah it is yeah yeah um Mm. But yeah, still possible, but just, you know, increasingly less likely. Yeah. Um, and also probably because she thinks she's pregnant, she's not having any sex with her husband, so she's not going to get pregnant. Yeah. <laughs> just make it worse. Um, <sighs> okay, so thoughts on why Margaret Lennox sends Philippa to meet with Elizabeth. Um, Well, it gives her a card to play like later, you know, if she, if she wants to have Philippa in her control in some way, or if she wants, like it, if she wants to manipulate the whole scene, which she absolutely does, having Philippa have this meeting with Elizabeth is something that she can bring up later, is something that she can use like it just mm -hmm. puts another, it puts another card in her hand. And Elizabeth is smart enough to know that and kind enough to warn Philippa about it. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Elizabeth is savvy. I mean, obviously she survived, so she had to be somewhat savvy. They're, in fact, Elizabeth and Philippa are both so savvy that I don't understand half of their conversation, which is incredibly witty. <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay, so I love this bit. I had to stop and reread because at the top of 32, there's this line that says, the delicacy of the hint was nothing sort of short of enchanting. And I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> and then I went back and read and I was like, uh, he would find more sincere emotion perhaps in the pro Marcello, but he's too wise, I'm sure to make witticisms about it. Okay, so that's the hint. And then what they're talking about is Marcellus, the Pope, and then he goes into this whole thing about all the pumps that I'm like, whoosh, way over my head. <laughs> yeah. Over my head, but um, entertaining to read about. Yeah. Um, they would be good friends. Yeah. And quite useful to each other. And, and you get the sense that Elizabeth's probably been starved for a conversation with someone, you know, at her same level of wit. And you can tell her what's going on. She's also a young woman. Like, you know, just have a friend who's a girl. Like, she's probably got all these older men around her you know, advisors and, and all that. And, yeah. um, and then we also have the bit about um, John Dee being arrested because he had done Elizabeth's horoscope and talked about Mary's, I guess, with her, which is treasonous. Yeah. Do they kill John Dee at this point? Is that when, does he, was he arrested and killed now? No, no, he's a powerful figure in Elizabeth's oh, okay. court. He's, he's younger here. Um, and then they also talk about Lyman and they have a really funny exchange where she describes the opposite of him and Philip was like, you know of him. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, which was great. Yeah, Philippa said dryly, I think your grace that you know him. And Liz was like, what? I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was fun. Super fun. Uh, huh. And then they exchange their gossip about the Lennoxes. And Philippe, you mentioned the Lennoxes are trying to get power in Scotland. And I think that's what Matthew Lennox is trying to do. Mm. Um, but it's my lady Lennox is apt to aim higher, dot, dot, dot. Have you met the boy Darnley? So Margaret Lennox isn't caring about power in Scotland. She wants the English throne, right. which does she thinks she's going to get it too. Well, and the interesting bit is she kind of does. Like her grandson is James the First, who is the James of James and Anne. James sailed across the sea to Mary Anne. Mm -hmm. Who was also uh, super into burning witches at the stake. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, and I love her. I love Philippa's, um, <laughs> Philippa's description of meeting Darnley where she says there was no meeting of souls. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and then, and then Elizabeth replied, "No, Lennox has one." Yeah, right. But it's just—it's just like that's a super polite way to say like I couldn't stand him. <laughs> yeah. No, Lennox has one. Yeah. Uh, 
And then there's more political stuff. I don't know if you want to talk about it, but at the bottom of 137, we get this um, bit about Philippa that uh, it's talking about sort of what she's learned. And it says um, uh, she had taken this post, she had taken the decision to desert this post she had taken so lightheartedly for adventure, for freedom, out of some petty need she saw now to prove her adulthood by manipulating the affairs of her elders. So that was like why she went to London. And now she's looking back at her motivations about why she went and calling them petty. Um, before coming to London, she viewed her life and that of her friends through the eyes of a child at Flaw Valley's or a child pushed by circumstance on a stormy but magnificent journey through Europe. Now she was wrought wiser. In this brief and dizzying apprenticeship, she had started to realize that whatever his occupation, Lyman's life was lived on this level. So then we get into this whole thing about Lyman and world affairs, um, which is interesting because Philippa's framing it to herself as if she's matured a lot, which I think she has. Um, but she still doesn't understand Lyman. Yeah. So. No, I mean, it, you know, it was Mr. Crawford thinking about the baby. Um, and now she's at the level of like, oh, you know, he really was legit in trying to stop Gabriel because Gabriel could destroy nations. Mm -hmm. um, but that's only one part of the story. We know he spent the whole time torn between killing Gabriel versus saving the kid. And it was not in any way an easy mm -hmm. vision, obviously. Right. And she doesn't even, like, that doesn't even come into her cost analysis of this whole thing she says that um had been made at a cost which the death of one evil powerful man grand mallet had only just merited the cost of months spent in limbo away from the world affairs so it was like to her in this moment the cost of that trip was not the death of this little boy it was that lyman was away from this world stage and he couldn't impact the world stage, but that the cost of being away was paid for by the death of Grand Mallet. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. Like she, she is maturing and seeing the world on a larger scale and wanting to affect it on a larger scale. But like you said, she still doesn't get Lyman. Yeah. She still has, she's still, she's still growing. And when this is where she has that thought about how she could not imagine um, how it would make any difference to Lyman about who his mother was. And it's like, hell of a... <laughs> That just doesn't make sense on a human scale. Like, it would make a difference to her who her mother was. <laughs> like, or could you imagine if she found out Kate wasn't her mother? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, what? Yeah. So. Yeah, that's why she decides to go to Russia. What do you think about her uh, deciding to go to Russia? <laughs> I'm not terribly surprised. Is she still yeah. there? I mean, it's it's a very headstrong decision that she makes, just like when she decided I'm coming to um, wherever you're going to help you search for your child. And then again, when instead of going back to England, when given the chance, she's like, no, sorry, Archie, we're going to this island off of uh, Greece. Yeah, she's still she her her essential character has not changed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she's she's like I'm gonna go. You just kind of get this sense like she's like I'm gonna go to Russia and drag him back, you know. And <laughs> I don't think that's gonna work. So no stopping Philippa. Um, so we skipped the political stuff, but I did have a note. Um, London was flooded with thousands of scurrilous pamphlets against religion and Parliament, the Council, the Queen, the King, blah blah. So just again, this idea that the queen, because she has this imaginary baby that she's not giving birth to, like this, her power base is crumbling. The people are rebelling. Like just the amount of pressure on her is just like crazy. And you can see why, like from the perspective of the people, they're like, this is not, she's burning people. Um, it's kind of rough. No bueno. Um, so then she goes to meet Leonard Bailey. Everyone says he's not home. So she just <laughs> through the window. Crawls through the window. Oh, I love this how she's this lady of the court of the queen, and she but she's still Philippa from Fall Valleys, and she wants in. She's going through the window. Mm. She's suspicious. So well, and she does think she's going to Russia. So she's like, it's my last chance. So I'm gonna go like search through the house. I guess. Um, 
thoughts on Leonard Bailey? Oh, Leonard. Like, oh, my goodness. He's an old, stodgy, bitter. bitter yeah. He's incredible. Like, there's this horrible thing that happened to him when he's a kid and a teenager, and he has never let go of it. Like, it's, this has, I mean, you just get the sense that he has just wallowed in this bitterness his entire life. And now he's this old man who is miserable because he's wallowed in this horrible thing that happened to him and he never let go of it. And it's like, it's, it's kind of like such a picture of like, we should just let go of stuff. Like, just like he, you would have a better life. Like he would have had a much better life if he had just let it go. (laughs) Yeah. He has a lot of of enmity for Sibylla. So angry. And it makes me wonder. So, okay. First of all, what is Gavin's father's name? Does, does Bailey ever mention his name? I went, I got to the end of the chapter and I was like, wait a second, what's his name? He talks about the first baron. He's the first baron of mid culture, and yeah. But I don't think they know his name. His name is mentioned in okay, earlier. What's his book. name? Because I forgot I'm it. Gonna I'm not going to tell you. Is if it you Lyman? <laughs> okay. Well, then I'm going to Google it because it'd be something that I should remember. Like, yeah. Um, so please don't Google it. <laughs> No, that's rude. If it's already, if it's a piece of information that has already been given to you. I I will tell you what it is. I don't want you to Google it because you will get spoilers if you Google it. His name is Francis Crawford the first. Okay. So, okay. So that is furthering. Okay. So this is my suspicion. I think, I think the first Baron is super shady like he's got there's something going on there and there's a piece of information we don't have that i think is really important and that's when he died um because obviously he's dead now and but we don't know when he died and i think that i think this whole timeline of like gavin marrying sibylla and this baron going away to france and all that is, I don't know. I just think it's super shady. And why did he abandon Gavin? And yeah, I don't know. And this is the grandfather that the Dom de Dutance was talking about, right? Right. I knew your grandfather. Yeah, yeah. And so like, he's involved in all of this. And it's, it's just, he's, I think he's essential. He's essential to it. He's mentioned in Queen's Play a fair amount. I mean, not a ton, but he's definitely mm-hmm. mentioned in Queen's Play. So, okay. I mean, it begs the question, if his name is Francis the first, I mean, it begs the question, did Sibylla have an affair with her father-in-law? But he seems like a dick. <laughs> like, I mean, from the description we get here. But we have to remember... The person telling us this story is incredibly bitter and has been like, I'm not sure. Cause we couldn't believe, we couldn't believe Sibylla's sister's story, or at least I don't think we can. So I'm a little bit suspicious that we can't believe this sort of story either. Right? Philippe, you were saying you thought it was somewhere in the middle. I think the truth lies somewhere in the middle. I do. I don't think either one is completely true. And I don't think either one is completely false. I think each story is, and I, I don't know what that is yet until I, I find out, but I, I would assume it's going to be somewhere in the middle. Yeah. I just do. I really do think that Sibylla is the mother of all of them. I do too. The children, and I, I think that includes Marta at this point. I'm not sure about Marta. I'm not, I'm not as sure about Marta, but I would like in a perfect world if Sibylla was Marta's mother and it wasn't that Gavin was Marta's father. So, yeah. I, uh, but I don't know. think 100%. I have no doubt that Sibylla is Gavin. No, sorry, not Gavin's mother. <laughs> that she is Richard. <laughs> so wrong no that she's Richard Lyman and Eloise's mother Mm -hmm. Gavin is Richard's father Uh, okay 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 going going crazy down this road 
if if Sibylla had an affair with her father-in-law slash was in love with him for some reason, which do she move, buddy? Movement in on your son's wife? Like, really? Um, and Lyman and Eloise are his kids. Then the question becomes, when did he die and when did Gavin die? Because if Gavin died before his father died, then Lyman is the Baron of Mid. Oh no, he'd be illegitimate. How does that work? My brain has gone wonky. <laughs> <laughs> because if Lyman and Gavin are brothers, not father and son, and Gavin died first, then Lyman would inherit mid culture, not Richard. But maybe if he's illegitimate, that doesn't count. I don't know. If he's illegitimate, it doesn't count. Mm -hmm. Okay. But would he be illegitimate if it's made public that that's what his parentage is? Like, yeah, unless unless Isabella married to her father. Oh, and sure. Lyman. Right. So is there a way to make because okay so here's this thing that i've been thinking since the very beginning is that i think it would be super interesting if this whole i did not expect it to go this direction but i thought it would be super interesting if this whole situation ended up with lyman being the legitimate heir of mid-culture and richard not um because of their relationship as brothers and what that would do with them i think it's super interesting if that's the case but for that to be the case Sibylla would have to be legally married to not Gavin, that she would have to be legally married to the father-in-law, which unless Bailey's story is way off, that can't be true. That can't be true. That just hurts too much to think about it right now. <laughs> My brain is gone. We'll, we'll get there eventually. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay. But it's a good theory. We can still have random man in France. Like it still could just be, it would be interesting actually if the father-in-law was just kind of manipulating the whole thing as like puppet master, you know, if he really is as cruel as Bailey has, if he really is genuinely as cruel as Bailey seems to cast him as, then could he just be a manipulator who is functioning like in France and Sibylla has been, like there is some random man X who is the father of these kids, but that the grandfather sort of manipulated everything. That could be, and might explain the name thing too. I don't know. It's a lot to chew on. Mm. Mm. But we've been thinking about this since the first book, so. Yep. Yeah, and the hints are in there of something, something fishy going on genetically. Yeah, right. Okay, so wait, Lyman is blonde. Mm -hmm. Is that the genetic part we were talking about? Because Lyman's blonde. Eloise was blonde, right? Richard Lyman's is not. Blonde. Gavin is not. I really don't want to go back to Queen's Play and read the whole book to find out if the <laughs> grandfather was blonde. Like, I just... I'm not going to do it. I'm not going down. That's that's a bridge too far. <laughs> We're just we'll just figure it out when it gets revealed. So if it if it never gets revealed, then I'll go back and read Queen's Play. <laughs> oh, I think it has to be revealed. It's too much of a mystery to leave unfinished. It has to. I mean, it doesn't have to be, but I would be upset if we don't get some definitive answers. I don't know though. I said I'd be upset if like the only thing I wanted in the last book was from no oh. to die. So like. I no, I have no sense of what my, <laughs> I feel like Dunnett can cross any bridge narratively and I would not be surprised. So. Aliens. Oh, Lyman no. is the child of aliens. Not that bridge. <laughs> you said any bridge. <laughs> okay. Yeah, she already had like psychic power, like reading someone's mind. That's true. How many know? genres are we going to have in this, in this series? Lyman's father is Dandy Hunter. 
Any other thoughts on no. chapter eight? Now we've gone into the realm of silliness. Um, okay, so yeah, it is okay. So his Bailey's sister, Honoria, was Francis the first wife that he apparently didn't care about at all or something. And she like had Gavin and died like really soon. And then, and then the grandfather just abandoned them to like mean servants. Like <laughs> that seems to be the story. Like the grandfather, like Francis the first ran off and abandoned his baby son and this kid brother-in-law to cruel servants. Like <laughs> it seems, I don't know. It seems really sad. And he was away at court in France, away for months, away sometimes for years. Um, but he heard, and we were told sneering by the men he had left to humiliate us. Gavin grew up as an animal grows with no gentle company, but what I could give him and I knew little enough, but he grew handsome. And when, and it was when the first Baron departed to France and stayed there that this woman laid hands on Gavin and married him, meaning Sibylla. So, hmm. so curious. We're going to get there. We're going to get there. Okay. All right, chapter, chapter nine. nine. The last part in part one. Um, also a bit of a shorter chapter. So Philippa is planning on leaving for Russia in two days. She is heading not back to Hampton Court Palace, but into the city with good, her, good old Foggy, her maid, and um, Dave, was it David? I forget, George, I don't know. Some <laughs> steward that's with her, he's not important. But um, they are stopped by Lennox's men and brought back to Hampton Court Palace, where Margaret sort of imprisons Philippa for a couple of days. So she misses the boat that she was going to take with Dick and Chancellor and that group. Um, somehow Margaret sort of knew that she was planning on leaving for Russia and had her stopped. So as soon as she gets out and is freed, she goes to see Lichpole and asks him about the letter, whether or not anybody else has read it. Um, we sort of finally find out for sure that the queen was never really pregnant and that it's all just you know, what we've already discussed. Um, King Philip decides that he's finally going to go to Brussels and leave the queen's side. So at this point, the queen dismisses Philippa from her service and says, you know, once King Philip comes back, then you may return. Um, and then we also find out that Margaret has sort of left this ultimatum with Dick and Chancellor that if he doesn't bring Lyman back, from Russia that Dickon, she's going to kill Dickon. She's going to seize Flaw Valleys and she's going to sort of have the queen force Kate to get remarried. So some pretty violent stuff in her head if she doesn't get Lyman back. She's so horrible. Mm -hmm. She's like a cat with like a <laughs> mouse that she wants to torture to death. Yeah. Like, how, you know, like if he's her enemy, she ought to be really glad that he's off yeah. in Russia, totally, you know, removed from her, but she just can't stand not like having power over him. Yeah. It makes me wonder how she reacted and what she was up to for like the year and a half that Lyman was out gallivanting around, you know, we didn't really see her interact with him at all in Ring, Ca Ring Castle, um, in the third book either, even when he was in Scotland for that bit. So, yeah, but I'm sure she was keeping tabs on him. Yeah, yeah, for sure. She's more on the background. For sure, for sure. Um, I do think it's interesting before she gets captured. Um, uh, there's this. Uh, she starts to think about Lyman's thoughts on his brother. Like she does actually start to think about it a little bit. 
um, <laughs> on 149 where she says, um, uh, it, she's trying to decide like should she say nothing about Bailey's story or not and then she says um suppose that given the chance Lyman would prefer to be the son of his mother on any terms whatsoever than to be the offspring of Gavin alone and it's like why didn't you think of this last time before you sent the previous letter and then and then it says later like she could plan nothing understand nothing until she had met and weighed up whatever Francis Ca Crawford had become so I mean, that's true. So maybe don't put all that information in a letter before you think about these things, but okay. Also, she is spending a lot of her time thinking about Frances Crawford. She is. Mm -hmm. she's, she's, in she's in love. She's in love with him. Well, maybe she may not realize it yet, but I think it's I fair. Think, I think she's got a crush on him. Can she really be in love with him if she doesn't know who he really is yet? I don't know, but I think she's interested. Certainly intrigued. I mean, I'm gonna go all the way to Russia so that I can bring you home to your mom. That's pretty, pretty intense. That's pretty, that's pretty strong. Well, also I'm gonna go with you into the far corners of the earth to save your baby. Like that's also, it's not like there aren't children in danger closer to home. It's not just that there was a toddler involved because there are plenty of toddlers around where she was that were probably in danger. And I think it's legit that she also cares very much about the family and, and all of that. But there is just like, you spend a lot of time thinking about not it. Not to mention the years she spent just absolutely despising him for the way he right. broke into her house and treated her parents. Right, which is what got me on this ship at the very beginning when she was like 10 or 11 years old and it was completely inappropriate, but she was still totally obsessed with them as a kid and it's like, <laughs> nothing's going on here. So, yeah. Uh, and Bartholomew Lichpole says this whole thing about how, I think one of you mentioned it earlier, but the there'll be trouble on a scale we've never known if the birth fails, which is another one of those, just this doom is lurking on the horizon. But that's pretty strong. I mean, trouble on a scale we've never known, like, it's not like Europe hasn't had some trouble before this point, so. It's just the entire Catholic power base in England will collapse. And like by the ending where Philip sails away, it's just like, that's your chance, it's gone. If he doesn't come back, you're not having, you have no chance of having a baby. Yeah. So. Well, I mean, maybe God will, you know, impregnate her for killing more, some, some more people on the stake. Hmm. Isn't that how it's done? Hmm. <laughs> I like I like the line where it's like you know she's in over her head and she's not that smart but she's trying really hard because you can also see that in these like terrible yeah. choices she makes she's just not that smart she's in way yeah. over her head yeah she's she is not making decisions based on the big picture for sure um <laughs> it's so interesting too that it's like life as royalty is weird because the fact that the queen gets her period is a huge international crisis <laughs> you're just like that's weird <laughs> you know but like at the bottom of 153 it's like uh the queen has restarted her courses <laughs> and then more it's just like doom <laughs> you know it's like devastating to jane dormer yeah I mean, I must imagine it, it would be devastating weird. for the queen as well, so. Oh, yeah. It's just really like, it's just, it's fascinating and like horrifying how these like most intimate, yeah. physical, personal yeah. things have this massive meaning and impact on a, not quite global, but, but like. Semi-global. Yeah. Like half, yeah. you know, a third of the globe is impacted by this deeply intimate personal I mean, I wouldn't want to be queen. I certainly wouldn't want to be queen in this situation. How no. awful. Uh, Margaret Lennox over there going, I, I'll take it. I want to be queen. No. Like, 
Mm, kind of miserable to me. It's like people who want to be famous. I'm like, do you really want to be famous? Like, it sounds kind of terrible. Um, yeah. So we have um, ended part one. And I'm curious what you think this is setting up and what you expect or hope will happen next. Um, well, I would like to know how the hell Margaret Douglas knows what she knows already. Um, I bet it's probably there. We're just missing the clues or it's not. And we'll find out later. But I want to know when she found out and how she found out and how much she actually knows. So. Uh, I feel like there's got to be some person in her camp that we don't know about. There's got, she's got to have a spy somewhere. There, I mean, there's so many spies. There's spies everywhere. So Margaret Lennox, de Lennox definitely has spies. So I feel like she's got someone in her pay or who's loyal to her planted somewhere. But um, I, I want to say that, I want to say that Lyman is going to come back and there'll be more action in Scotland, but it feels like the whole Russia stuff is completely unfinished. Like there's got to be more, like we've got to stay in Russia. Like there's no way that we're done with Moscow at this point. No way. So, so I don't think he can come back with, with Dickon, which for as little as we know about Dickon, I kind of like him. Like, I really don't want him to get destroyed by Margaret Lennox. So I'll be interested. Like I'll be interested to see how he interacts with Lyman and, you know, what sort of stuff he'll be getting into when he gets to Russia, which should probably be in the next part. So I could see like part two being like the fulfillment of the Russia storyline and then Lyman coming back in the end. Maybe. Or maybe he just is in Russia till the end of the book. We don't you know i'll be kind of sad if dickon is the spy i don't yeah. know i just want him to be friends with henry sydney and not like and not be not be a betrayer it's hard for him to be the spy like unless he's just being threatened into spy yeah you know? mm -hmm. which could be because he's another one that would probably be easy easily manipulated by good old mar margie yeah peggy peggy can we, Lennox. Can we, call her, we call her Margie from now <laughs> Margie. Yeah, if she was here, she would murder both of you. <laughs> yeah, I'm not doubting that at all. That is absolutely true. We could call her Greta. Oh. <laughs> why do you like, uh, why do you like? I, you know, I her? don't know. I just feel, I was just thinking about that. I, I don't know why I like him. Now I need to go back and figure it out. I think I like, there's been a couple of mentions of like, he and Henry Sidney's deep loyalty to each other. And like Henry Sidney made some comment about how when it comes to like promises and secrets, he and Dickon are one man, you know? And I just, I, I like that idea of like friends who are deeply loyal to each other. Um, and then there's this, and there's a slight sense that he's kind of interested in Philippa. Um, it talks about how he's got like two boy, two sons or something. And, and yet he's kind of interested in Philippa, which, you know, good taste. And yet he doesn't seem creepy about it. So like, I don't know. I don't know if that's why though. Well, now I'm worried that he's going to be the bad guy because <laughs> I like him. So, Ugh. I mean, I think we have our bad guy for this book, but it's depending on who's working for her. Yeah, it's minor bad. I, I'm now I'm afraid he's going to be like henchman bad guy. Um, who knows? Unless it's Gabriel and he's really not dead. Definitely dead. <laughs> he's he's dead. quite dead. I know. Got to be dead. If that happened, that no, <laughs> that's that's the bridge too far. That yeah, that's that if done. It would cross. Then it would have jumped the shark if she brought him back. I don't. Zombie Gabriel. Huh? Zombie Gabriel. Oh, she yeah. bring him back as a zombie. No, no, no. We are going far afield. Gabriel um, had a twin brother. <laughs> it's also it's also interesting to note though that 
Lennox, Margaret, to go back to Margaret Lennox, is that not only is she uh, threatening Dickon with death and, and all of that, but she also says that if Francis doesn't come back, he, she will have him killed, which either that's an empty threat or she does have men in Moscow and Russia. Like she has, she has her, her reach extends that far. So it seems, I, I, I don't, she doesn't seem to be the empty threat kind of person. <laughs> like, so yeah. Maybe that's how she gets her information. Maybe that she does have people planted in the, you know, if, I mean, if Francis has people all over Europe and in Scotland who are reporting to him, it, it's not out of the realm of possibility that she just has somebody in the, in the Russian court who's reporting to her and like, hey, this guy Lyman showed up, you know, that's. Not at all. She, um, she's certainly his match at like, you know, devious cleverness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And he's been there for a while. So, so if she does have someone planted in the Russian court, like the news of Lyman's arrival would have gotten to her a while ago. I mean, like, cause we've had time for letters to go back and forth at least once or twice since, since he arrived there. So, so yeah. Now that Philippa is no longer in the court, do we think that she's still going to head to Russia? Mm. Yeah, she missed the boat. Yeah. It's like the one boat that's going to Russia. They, they don't really have like a regular yeah. thing that's going yeah. to Russia. I mean, where's, where's Archie? Is he still in Scotland? She could just be like, Archie, take me to Russia. Archie, now. go to Russia. <laughs> no yeah i don't think she can get there mm. so either this whole story is going to play out lyman's in russia philippa's in england and scotland and we just have these parallel tracks for the entire book or at some point they meet up but i think it's going to have to be lyman coming this direct like towards england and scotland mm. it would, i don't know hmm. but why would he well, I mean, to annul the marriage. Yeah, like it, to find out the depends, truth of his parentage. It depends on how serious he takes these threats about they're going to marry off Kate and sell sell Flaws Valley, and and he's, you know, I don't think the threat of his own death is really going to sway him all that much, but he definitely gets swayed by threats to other people. So, yeah, um, I mean, Margaret Lennox could threaten Philippa. Philippa's life like Lyman if you don't come back I'll kill her you know I'm able to you know I can have it done yeah and it's also Margaret Lennox which I think that's also a motivation for him like can he thwart her like, I just want him to come back and slap her he doesn't want her to win like so that could be are we gonna have a big Lyman Margaret Lennox showdown in this book at the end of the book. I hope so. I hope so. Yeah, that would be awesome. Um, although, hmm, do you know? Do we want? Do we want them to have a big showdown, like a finale showdown at the end of this book, or do we want Margaret Lennox to be the villain in the last? Because we've only got one more book after this. Yeah. So, like, do we want Margaret Lennox to be the villain in the sixth book? In which case, is book five going to end on a? like a book three note. Like I could see that happening where book five ends on a similar note to book three, where it's like kind of a win, but actually sort of disaster. And we have to, like, it just leads right into book six. And then Margaret Lennox is like this, you know, some horrible villain or something, some disaster has happened and they have to fix it in book six. I'm really interested in how she died historically and whether or not oh. that's going to come into play. Oh. If it's I have not Googled okay. her. No, me neither. But like, <laughs> I'm wondering if Dorothy will write Lyman into it somehow. I know, I know. I so I completely agree. Like, how did she die and where, where was she and what ended up? Obviously she doesn't become queen of England. So we know that, but mm -hmm. I have no clue what to her because she wasn't a historical figure that I ever paid attention to. So. Well, I'm sure she falls out of grace as soon as Elizabeth takes power. So, 
but maybe does she because her son ends up marrying mary queen of scots right so True. she can't fall completely oh <laughs> we'll find out okay yeah yeah this is why i've stayed away from any like european history googling or anything or scottish history googling because i'm like it would ruin book six, but oh, I'm gonna lick my paw. She's been here the whole time, actually. Oh, was that the other cat that was up on the the back of the couch earlier? Yeah, that was River. I can't tell them apart yet. Harlem is the one with all the <laughs> shaved locks from all the medical. Okay, are we done um, with that? <laughs> I think we're done. Any final um, comments before we wrap? Um, just, I'll be happy to see what's going on with Lyman. Yeah, so. I miss Lyman. Mm -hmm. I want to know what's going on with him. Also, I really, really, really want to have a Lyman, Philippa, Margaret Lennox scene in this book. I really, really, really want to see that. And like, I think at this point, Philippa has grown so much but Margaret Lennox is still, like, I think Margaret Lennox can beat her politically. Like, she's still, like, Philippa is not, has not matured or grown as much as Margaret Lennox in this arena. I mean, Margaret Lennox has, like, Second. she's yeah. 40 now, like, 40 yeah. years of, you know, political right. savvy at the highest level of yeah. politics. So, so yeah. she's still such a threat to Philippa and to Lyman and but but I want to see like I want to see Philippa grow in this area like I want her to have I I know that that Lyman is our protagonist over the whole series and all of that but but I would really love to see Philippa win over Margaret Lennox in some way I think mm -hmm. I'd really like to see that so yeah yeah all right that's a good thing to hope for on that note thank you everyone for watching and commenting see you next <laughs> time <laughs>